In the late 1920s and early 30s, William Haynes was one of Hollywood's most popular stars. He was also one of the few actors who made the successful transition from silent films to talkies. And as you'll see in Out of the Closet, Off the Screen, Haynes was also gay. And despite intense pressure from the studios to conceal his sexuality, Haynes refused and abruptly walked away from Hollywood. This is his story. On the day they struck this glamorous pose, the man and woman in this MGM publicity shot reigned as the two most popular movie stars in America. The liquid eyes and arched brows on the left belong to Joan Crawford, but the dashing profile on the right belongs to one of history's forgotten stars, Billy Haynes. Billy Haynes was named the top male movie star in the world. There was nobody bigger than Billy Haynes in 1930. He was the equivalent of Clark Gable a few years later. Yet a mere two years after being named Hollywood's number one star, Billy Haynes vanished from the screen driven into exile by a moral code that forced him to choose between the world he had conquered and the love of his life. Not the woman he loved, but the man. In 1933, Billy Haynes was the toast of Hollywood, America's top box office draw. He was also a homosexual who lived openly, some said brazenly, with his male lover, Jimmy Shields. I said in my book, Mommy Dearest, and, and a lot of people picked up on it, that my mother actually said that she thought, she said, you know, I think they have the best marriage in Hollywood. One person who did not think Billy had the best marriage in Hollywood was his boss, MGM's Louis B. Mayer. Louis B. Mayer never liked Billy Haynes, and Louis B. Mayer certainly did not approve of uh, his sexual orientation. Or his stubborn refusal to play along with a charade of arranged dates and stage marriages that Hollywood expected of gay actors. One day in 1933, Mayer delivered Haynes an ultimatum. That uh, either he could continue his contract with MGM Studios as an actor, or he can choose his partner, um, Jimmy Shields. According to Hollywood legend, Billy didn't miss a beat. I'll be glad to give up Jimmy, just as long as you give up your own wife. With that wisecrack, Billy Haynes' stardom was snuffed out. If Billy's refusal to hide his homosexuality seemed outrageous in 1933, it seems remarkably courageous today. After all, 70 years later, there is still not a single male romantic lead who has dared to be openly gay. It's a taboo. It's sort of the last frontier, and it hasn't been broken yet. It's remarkable, then, that Hollywood's original gay star hailed not from some sophisticated city, but from the rural Shenandoah Valley, far from the Hollywood Hills. It was here, in prosperous Stanton, Virginia, that Billy Haynes was born on January 2nd, 1900. The Haynes's were a respected local family, this is a wonderful shot of a parade in the early uh, 20th century, uh, a parade in Stanton, and the, the second f uh, float uh, shows a smoking cigar. Uh, the Haynes family were cigar manufacturers in the city, and this was their entry in that parade. Young Billy, however, was a black sheep from the start. A natural athlete, he would have nothing to do with sports. 
Instead, he was drawn to the interests of the mother he adored, sewing, cooking, and the interior decoration of Stanton's great homes. He had an interest in, in stylish things. There is even uh, a reference to him redecorating his bedroom in his house, and his grandfather didn't approve of it at all. Yet Billy was rarely teased for what bullies might call his sissy interests. Billy was very butch. He was deep-voiced. He was very masculine. When he was teased, he fought back with wisecracks, defending himself with laughter instead of fists. His looks and sense of humor enabled him to not merely survive, but thrive. He had a personality that was hard to dislike. Everyone liked Billy Haynes. Billy himself loved the movies and ached to join their glamorous world of big cities and handsome, sophisticated heroes. And then, at 14, revelation. Billy discovered sexuality, which in his case meant homosexuality. I never discussed my life before 14. The things that happen after 14 are so much more important because one is conscious of sex. Determined to find a place where he could live his life authentically, at just 15, Billy ran away. It's a narrative that I think a lot of people can still relate to, that breaking away, you're, a, you're the square peg in a community of round holes. His first stop was Hopewell, Virginia, a teeming boom town of floating brothels and cutthroat thieves, gamblers, and prostitutes. A born hustler, Billy and a few friends opened a makeshift dance hall, which prospered until one windy night when the entire slapdash town of Hopewell, along with Billy's dance hall, went up in flames. Undaunted, the would-be dandy headed north to the place that would change his life forever. New York City, a grimy, glittering Oz, drowning in bathtub gin, teeming with flappers, and Fitzgerald's flaming youth, scandalizing Victorian moralists with bohemian parties and shocking talk of free love. Gay men and lesbians were remarkably open in the village in the 1920s. There were cafeterias in Sheridan Square with plate glass windows where gay men wearing mascara and makeup would gather and gaze out of the streets on the street who were, would actually gather and gawk at them because they didn't see anything like that outside of the village. Billy was enthralled, handsome and young, with a carefree attitude in perfect sync with the times. He soon had a stream of lovers. He spent time with a largely homosexual theater crowd that included the future director, George Cukor, the future designer, Ori Kelly, and a young acrobat named Archie Leach, later known as Cary Graham. He moved in a world that was, um, there were chorus girls and chorus boys and drag queens and um, people that lived a little bit on the edge. No one in Billy's circle could really be considered openly gay in the modern sense, since the modern identity of sexual orientation had not yet been conceived. But men who were attracted to men often adopted certain well-recognized roles. There were self-described fairies who advertised their effeminacy with shocking red bow ties, and those called punks or trade who adopted a tough working-class demeanor. And then there were the so-called wisecrackers, like Billy himself. Elegant men whose appreciation of the theater, antiques, and fine clothes was accompanied by a sharp, scathing wit. It was a, a sensibility that he kept with him all his life. A person could be forgiven for illiteracy, but never for the lack of good taste. Then one day came the chance meeting that would ultimately make him a star. Crossing a Manhattan street, he caught the eye of a top Hollywood agent. I like your face, she said. So do I, but it ain't mine. I'm breaking in for a friend. In just a few weeks, Billy was named the new face of 1922, signed to a studio contract and packed off to Hollywood. 
Hollywood started out as just being this little sagebrush town and uh, at the far frontier of the, of the United States. And these people came out to create out of that wilderness this, this land of dreams. And I think there was a sense that we can do anything we want out here. For the exuberant Billy Haynes, that small patch of Southern California was probably the only place outside New York where he could live an open, authentic life. Hollywood was a haven for free thinkers and free lovers in the 1920s. What was, what was being created in Hollywood was a, a community of, of people who lived on the margins. There was a sense that we can do anything we want out here. Flaunting old-fashioned gender roles, women smoked and drank, had flagrant affairs, and ran their own lives. And men did some experimenting of their own. On screen, the biggest stars were sleek, pampered heroes like Rudolph Valentino and Ramon Navarro. Early 20s and early 30s, this sort of wonderful possibility of ambivalence in male sexuality, and that's seen in the, in the movie stars. Where women are being dreamed of being seduced by a guy who's better dressed than they are, and that's the world that William Haynes entered. To friends and colleagues, Billy pretended it was all a wild lark, a great excuse for a party and a laugh. But his memory of his first meeting with the studio suggested otherwise. The office was two miles long, and my knees were knocking together with fright. But I bolstered up enough courage to be flippant. I walked up to the seats and I said, I'm your new beauty prize. Bud's career kind of languished for a while in very undistinguished supporting roles. It wasn't until movies like Sally, Irene and Mary and Tell It to the Marines that his uh, reputation started building. Abandoning any attempt to fit into the classic silent formula of the Latin lover, mature romantic lead, or Chaplin-esque clown, Haynes concocted his own type, based on his own personality as a wisecracker. It was a strategy that gave him the extra confidence to conquer his nervousness. I argued it out with myself. Why should I be afraid of the camera? It was an inanimate object and couldn't reach out and bite me in the chin. It had the faculty of photographing thought as well as features, so I made up my mind that I would think more about what I was doing, to try and live the role. By the time Billy Haynes read the script that would make him a star, he was ready. That script was Brown of Harvard, a comedy that epitomized what would become the classic Billy Haynes formula. A smart aleck youth, thoughtless and conceited, who emerges as a hero, winning the heart of the heroine and the audience. At the urging of his ambitious friend, Joan Crawford, Billy plunged into the fray of studio politics, lobbying hard for the part. I was determined that no one but William Haynes would play the role of Tom Brown. I would turn him inside out and make him the freshest punk that ever drew breath. Having won the role, Billy surprised the studio with a performance that was natural, breezy, and endearing. Billy's new wisecracker persona was clearly modeled on an androgynous jumble of Greenwich Village gay mannerisms. Part of what makes him made him so popular was his, his very queerness. This was the mantra of the Roaring Twenties. There were no limits, there were no boundaries. Old rules were, were being broken down, and I think his screen persona was perfect for that time. But he always remained ambivalent about his alter ego, a construction that he used as a shield. The wisecrack is my shell, my protection. <laughs> At heart, I'm not a wisecracker. William Haynes, the wisecracker, came into being in Hollywood. Brown of Harvard proved the comedy event of the year. Billy's breakthrough role, making a fortune for the studio and a national star out of William Haynes. With a string of follow-ups, each more successful than the last, Billy roared through the rest of the decade as the toast of the town, the most golden, most open homosexual Hollywood had ever seen. But it wouldn't be long before a more somber decade and a less forgiving morality would ring the curtain down.
While waiting for Brown of Harvard to be released, Billy took a brief trip to Greenwich Village. And there, on the same New York streets where he was discovered almost three years earlier, Billy Haynes made a discovery of his own. His name was Jimmy Shields, a handsome 21-year-old from a prominent Daytona Beach family. Taunted as a sissy back home, Jimmy was just finishing a difficult two-year stint in the Navy when he looked up to see a handsome stranger on the street. Billy and Jimmy were complete opposites. Jimmy was, was effeminate. Billy was very butch. But opposites attract. They found in each other their completion. Within a few days, their one-night stand would blossom into a relationship that would barely change for 50 years. Billy, the successful star, Jimmy, his devoted partner. Jimmy always deferred to Billy with that arrangement. Uh, you can't have fights. And uh, I think they, I, I always thought, felt they were very well matched and very happy together. Having found the love he was looking for, Billy was hardly about to hide his happiness from anyone. Within a, a short time of their meeting, they were living openly together and entertaining Irving Thalberg and other studio officials and members of the press. It may seem incredible today that Billy and Jimmy could have lived openly as a couple, but the film industry of the 1920s was not conformist, conservative, or homophobic. Amid Hollywood's fabled night spots and casting couches, its opium love cults and naked pool parties, the whispered homosexual affairs of stars like Rudolph Valentino, Ramon Navarro, and Greta Garbo seemed like just another exotic part of the atmosphere. Protection was provided by an elaborate system of press, publicity, and raw power. The studios controlled the press. They controlled what was said and what was not said about their uh, major actors. Studios worked with fan magazines to pump out mythic stories of the stars while carefully shielding their grainier secrets from the public. All the writers knew it, but they depended on the movies. They didn't want to cause it to sink. Everybody's income came from the, from the stars. With movie magazines in the pocket of the studios, even gay and lesbian stars felt free to live fairly authentic lives within certain limits. What some of the survivors of the era call it is the difference between being overt and circumspect. And by far most actors were circumspect. Being circumspect involved playing along with reporters or going along with arranged dates and fake photo opportunities. Billy didn't really go for this. He didn't like this kind of baloney. He created this wisecracking character who, you know, somebody would say, how come there's been never any woman linked to you in the press? And he'd say, oh, I'm too busy buying antiques. Not many people could have gotten away with that, but he had this persona that deflected that kind of questioning. Irreverent and hilarious in person, Billy was invited everywhere, and he and Jimmy emerged as fixtures at everything from black tie premieres to speakeasies. They told riotous jokes. Everything was happy and disrespectful and funny, and just there was a feeling of, of good times. He emerged as a ringleader of the so-called younger degeneration at William Randolph Hearst's fabled San Simeon estate, where he and Jimmy were the only unmarried couple allowed to share a room, aside, that is, from Hearst and his mistress, Marion Davies. His closest pal, however, was ambitious young ingenue, Lucille Lesseur. When MGM renamed her Joan Crawford, she was horrified, but Billy simply teased her. When she first heard it, she begged them not to do that to her because she said it sounded like crawfish. So William Haynes heard that and teased her unmercifully. Crawford's not so bad. They could have called you Cranberry and served you with the turkey. He would call her Cranberry from then on, something no one else would dare to do. If there was a, an area of vulnerability, of course, his sense of humor went right to it. And every time he did it, she'd say, oh, Willie, don't do that. You know I hate that. He said, I know, <laughs> I know, we all know. And it would go on. Sensing a kindred spirit, Billy began to mold her in his own image. Following his lead, 
she blossomed into Hollywood's most scandalous flapper, famous for her tabletop Charlestons. They would remain fiercely devoted for life. I think she was more comfortable with him and, and with Jimmy than anybody else in the world. She didn't have to put on any pretenses with him because she met him when he was a big, big movie star and she was a chorus girl. One day he came in and he said, oh dear, they had been out to a dinner party the night before. He said, oh dear, went in to pick her up and my gracious, he said, I had to edit the jewels. They had to be pared down. <laughs> But as a new moral conservatism crept into Hollywood, Louis Mayer began to fear disaster if word of Billy's sexuality leaked out. He begged him to stop living openly with Jimmy and start romancing an eligible starlet. Louis Mayer said I didn't have any sex appeal. And I said, oh, he was quite wrong. I said, Mr. Mayer, before I came out here, I was kept by the best men and women in New York City. I appealed to both sexes. He never forgave me for that. Thumbing his nose at Mayor's concerns, Billy now turned his relationship with Jimmy into a public spectacle. They bought a lavish new house together in Hollywood, and Billy indulged his passion for antiques by doing the interior decoration himself. The results astonished Hollywood. William Haynes opened his new house in Hollywood so beautifully done that no one would even recognize it. That is one of the most delightful small houses in the film community. Tallulah Bankhead dubbed it the Haynes Castle. It quickly became the center of Hollywood society. As the century and Billy Haynes turned 30 together, and after he triumphed in his first talking picture, the prestigious Quigley Poll voted him America's number one male star the king of Hollywood. But on Wall Street, the crash would soon usher in the Depression. In Congress, hand-wringing about Hollywood indecency would prompt the industry to crack down on its own. In society at large, a rebellious, irreverent era was about to give way to a conformist age, in which Billy and Jimmy's kind of love would be deemed an unspeakable vice and banished from public view. By the middle of 1930, Billy Haynes could look back on one of Hollywood's most remarkable careers. Billy Haynes was the top box office star of 1930. Um, that means even more than it, it meant 20 years later when there was television to contend with and, and other forms of celebrity. At the time, movies were it for people. But now, the bohemian world of the 1920s that made Haynes a star suddenly ended in economic collapse. Some consider this just retribution for a sinful decade. A moral panic infected the national mood. Crusaders stepped up their demand for movie censorship and their attacks on the scandalous off-screen behavior of the stars. Foibles that seemed innocent in the Roaring Twenties came to seem suspicious, even subversive. So that which was tolerated as colorful before became, this is something that's dangerous, it could cost us. There certainly was a dampening of the climate. At the same time, Americans began embracing modern psychiatry and its scientific approach to mental health. Homosexuality would be labeled a frightening, intractable mental illness. It's really just beginning in the 1930s that psychological explanations of homosexuality became a major part of the, the culture. And homosexuals were seen as psychopaths who threatened the nation's children. Across the nation, gay clubs were raided, and homosexuals were hounded from jobs, blackmailed, sometimes arrested. Part of the reaction to that was, was fueled by the Depression, by the sense that people were now tired of those kind of excesses, and indeed that those excesses had led to the current suffering. So there was this, this reaction against that kind of gay, queer, outrageous frivolity. As social attitudes hardened, the sexual ambiguity of the 1920s stars, like Valentino, went decidedly out of style, replaced by tough guys like James Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, and Clark Gable. These were men, these were he-men, these were macho men. The, the paradigm of the gender-ambiguous star that had been so popular in the 1920s 
was now viewed as suspect. In the rush to respectability, even flappers like Joan Crawford settled down. She was jumping up on the top of tables doing the Charleston. You know, by the end of the 1930s, of course, she was giving off another image, one of, you know, I'm the perfect mother. Good night, mother. Good night, mother, dear. Good night, darling. Happy dreams. God bless. In late 33, 34, um, a bunch of stars who were well-known, who were single men, suddenly got married all at once, uh, clearly under pressure from the studios, who wanted to straighten up the image of their stars. Now, in the face of this overwhelming tide, Billy Haynes made an inexplicable, disastrous career move. In the MGM comedy, Way Out West, he agreed to star as a campy carnival barker in the most effeminate role of his career. I'm the wildest pansy you ever picked. They don't pick that word pansy out of a hat. They, this, was, this had some resonance in the culture at the time. Shocked to see him actually swish across the screen, <laughs> Depression-era audiences were not amused. The queer became much too obvious, and I, audiences sat back and said, this is not something we want to see. I mean, what was he thinking of when he did it? You're so surprised to see a, a movie by a major studio in which you have this, the hero sort of camping it up wildly. To make matters worse, Way Out West revealed that the former juvenile star's waistline was starting to spread and his hairline beginning to recede. What was charming for a younger actor as he's growing older becomes less charming as he ages. Way Out West was more than just a box office flop. For Billy Haynes, it was a staggering career misstep he would struggle to live down. How would you erase in the public's mind the memory of this wonderfully fay cowboy? Here it was, out of the closet, and it would be hard to, to bring him back in after that. Overnight, Billy's stock in Hollywood plummeted, and MGM handed him a string of forgettable roles in films that performed far below expectations. The studio wasn't behind him. Mayor wasn't behind him. Uh, and therefore the whole machinery to keep Haynes in place as a top flight star was starting to go. Instead of protecting himself, Billy defiantly remained the city's most visible homosexual. Then, in a police raid in a gay bar, Billy Haynes was arrested. The details remain obscure, largely because MGM covered up the affair. But the recent number one star was devastated to find that he had been demoted to a mere featured player. Last year, I was pointed out as being one of the best drawing cards on the screen. Now they say, there goes that big lug. Meanwhile, Will Hayes and his new production code, which would prohibit all discussion of homosexuality in the movies for 40 years, was striving to eliminate gays entirely from the industry. Being gay was becoming dangerous. In the spring of that year, Will Hayes was being quoted in Variety as saying he wanted the dual sex boys and lesbos out of movies. Some of the reformers who were calling for boycotts of the movies, saying that some of our top stars and directors are perverts. We need to get them out. Journalistic sharks and the increasingly independent press began to circle. He was not in a very safe position to uh, negotiate here. His, his off-screen pre press was filled with innuendo. One devastating article in Photoplay hinted that Billy kept house, quote, just like a housewife. Another in Vanity Fair declared, there is a great deal of the woman in him. Haynes found himself routinely described as sensitive and temperamental, code words easily deciphered by those in the know. Confirmed bachelor was another one, uh, you know, which, which was code for gay, just as the term women's director in Q Corps was, was a term for that, you know, he was gay and was better with women somehow. Billy Haynes was really too gay in his films, too gay in the public personas for the studios to bring him back and straighten him up. Finally, in 1933, Mayor had had enough. Calling Billy into his office, he issued a non-negotiable ultimatum. Get married or get off the lot. He said, but you have to send Jimmy Shields to Europe on a vacation for a year and not come back for a year. And uh, 
Bill said he refused to do it. Word spread that Billy was fired on the spot after he wisecracked that he would be glad to get married and give up Jimmy, provided Mayer gave up his own wife. No one had ever stood up to Louis B. Mayer that way before. What Haynes did was to say that I have now lived my life here in Hollywood for the last 10 years in a certain way, in a certain way that was authentic and, and honest. He wasn't about to change that. He wasn't going to kick Jimmy out of his house. I think that a lot of people, but particularly Joan Crawford, admired that kind of courage. It was a stunningly swift fall from number one star in 1930 to unemployed three years later. For most stars, being dropped by a studio like MGM meant literally the end of their existence as actors. Invitations stopped, and many former stars descended into drugs, alcoholism, and despair. But for William Haynes, dismissal from MGM would inaugurate a whole new career, in which his openness would become not a hindrance, but a key to his success. God had it. 1933 was a bad year to face unemployment. In the depths of the Depression, millions stood on bread lines and slept in boxcars. But instead of despairing, Haynes had a plan. Well aware that most stars longed to live the romantic lives they portrayed, he decided to carve a new career by transplanting the glamorous designs of movie sets from the studio lot right into the star's living room. In a sense, he had already begun years earlier, decorating the homes of friends like Joan Crawford. She was one of the first to commission him to do her house. Um, this is while he was still an actor and was doing this kind of as a sideline. He did it all in white and it kind of set a trend. Haynes had received rays for turning Crawford's house into a living set. Our house was one of the first and was almost like a showcase. And the house was completely and totally transformed. There was a lot of white. It got whiter and whiter as the years went by. <laughs> Crawford publicly promoted him as a talented decorator and invited him everywhere, keeping him in the public eye. It took courage to publicly applaud, be friends with, and support somebody that had been ostracized, outed by the, by the powers that be. She was one of the first to encourage him to be a decorator to the stars. I heard those conversations. I mean, this is not secondhand information. She was a great cheerleader for him. Of course, when it came to Joan Crawford, even staunch support could be stretched a bit thin. There were a couple of times that colors were heatedly discussed and how she would look in those colors. I don't mean to wear, but to sit in. <laughs> At Crawford's clever suggestion, Billy approached another close friend, Carol Lombard, with an offer. At the time, Lombard hosted Hollywood's most sensational parties. I offered to do her house without charging a fee, knowing that if people liked what I did, I'd have a business foundation. Billy's striking transformation of Lombard's home into what seemed like a dream sequence from one of her most glamorous films made it clear that with Haynes designing your house, you could not only act the glamorous life, you could live it. Billy Haynes, the designer, found himself in hot demand. Haynes' background um, as a film star with an understanding of the film set and the backdrop and the matte painting and the general idea of the composed environment absolutely had a great impact on the way that he approached doing interior design for his clients. I think coming out of, out of, uh, out of movies as he did, he was very aware of how a room should look and how it made people look. Billy Haynes' style is part of that whole sort of Southern California Regency style. They invented a style of architecture and a style of interior design that went with um, 
big money in a great climate. The openness that doomed him as a star now seemed to help him in a decorating career where he thrived precisely by being himself. He kept on seeing all his great friends in the movies anyway and could do whatever he liked. He didn't have to worry about scandal anymore because nobody cared what interior decorators do. Commissions poured in, and by 1936, Billy had engineered a remarkable comeback, from dismissed star to star designer. But then, in May of 1936, it all threatened to come crashing down. For several years, Billy had rented an oceanfront house in Manhattan Beach, 20 minutes south of Los Angeles. Neighbors in the conservative enclave were suspicious of the homosexual men who regularly trooped out to the Haynes Cottage, a crowd that included Cole Porter, director George Cukor, and costume designer Ori Kelly. On May 31st, Jimmy was walking his dog alone on the beach when neighbors noticed him chatting with a local boy, Jimmy Walker. The father assumed that something terrible had happened, I guess, and he went to the neighbors and got the neighbors all riled up that evening, as Billy arrived for the weekend with guests, an angry, violent crowd had gathered. The whole entourage came down from the studios for the weekend. All these people were milling around outside. Suddenly, the mob began chanting, let's clean up the town. And they just ran for the house. When Billy and Jimmy confronted the mob, they were surrounded, beaten savagely, and forced to flee for their lives. The attack made headlines across the nation. Billy's steadfast defense of Jimmy seemed vindicated when the boy failed to identify Jimmy in a hearing. But although no charges were filed, the damage was done. Billy Haynes's homosexuality was scandalous, nationwide front page news, and he faced public disgrace and professional ruin. But once again, Joan Crawford came to the rescue. She wasn't a very good mother, but she was a hell of a good friend. She was incredibly loyal. And by keeping him invited to parties, by keeping him in uh, the industry's eyes, she's, she was always there to kind of stand up and reinforce her friendship with him. Billy's name began reappearing on invitation lists and in society columns. Within a year of Manhattan Beach, Billy was back on top. In 1945, Billy took on young partner Ted Graber. Next to Jimmy, Ted became the most important person in Billy's life, the son he never had. Together, their business expanded to include their custom-designed furniture. Today, Hollywood's top stars and collectors bid thousands for a single chair or end table. Many of the clients who approach me for his pieces are today's moguls, today's blonde bombshells. The furniture was not machined. It was all hand-finished. Hand Everything was, was specially done and done by hand. It continues to be extremely important. As he grew older, Hollywood's most open homosexual found himself embraced by some of America's most powerful conservatives. He was giving Hollywood glamour to people who weren't necessarily glamorous, the Annenbergs and the Bloomingdales, and um, it was wonderful. I mean, he, he was able to give them almost movie star Sheen. His sexuality and relationship with Jimmy were quietly accepted, even by friends like Ron and Nancy Reagan. They simply had nothing to do with people who didn't accept them as a couple. In the late 60s, this wealthy, now elderly gay pioneer found it difficult to comprehend the youthful emergence of gay lib. Like so many of his generation, he, he couldn't quite integrate that into his experience. The idea that being gay required parades and marching in the street was not something that he had ever felt was necessary. Then in 1970, when most of his friends had long since retired, Billy received the commission of a lifetime. Walter Annenberg was appointed American ambassador to Great Britain and hired Billy and Ted to give the high-profile ambassadorial residence a total overhaul. It 
was a marvelous residence, big Georgian residence that Barbara Hutton had built in the 30s. They had a wonderful time doing this and, and finding marvelous antiques to fit into the architecture of the residence. Uh, it was a special, it was a very special job to do. Finally, Billy was ready to take it easy for the first time in his life. But just a year into his retirement, he was diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer. As his health rapidly failed, the once tireless host disappeared into seclusion. Near the end, he summoned the strength to visit a house recently decorated by his partner and protege, Ted Graber. He was in a wheelchair, and um, we took him through the house. And he looked up, and he looked at Ted, and he said, the student has surpassed the master. Just a few years later, that same student would receive America's ultimate design commission, the redecoration of the White House under Nancy Reagan. But Billy would not live to see it. In late 1973, he left home to enter the hospital for the last time. And he walked to the door of the house and he turned around and he just looked around at all that he had designed and built in the house and he just said, oh hell, and turned around and walked out to the car and he never came back. On Christmas Day, 1973, he exchanged small gifts with Jimmy in the hospital and managed a few words and a weak smile. The next day, as Jimmy sat holding his hand, Billy Haynes slipped quietly away. He was 73. The obituaries named his brothers and sisters as survivors. Jimmy Shields, his partner of 50 years, was ignored. He just could not imagine going on through life without Billy. He didn't know how to, they'd been together so many years. Friends tried to comfort Jimmy, but to no avail. He was completely despondent. And uh, I remember one evening, we were going out to uh, dinner. I remember him telling me in our automobile ride to the restaurant, he said, I have no life without Billy. He was, he was everything. And, uh, it was rather touching. Yeah. Less than three months after the death of the man who had given up Hollywood stardom for his love, Jimmy taped a note to his bedroom door and swallowed a bottle of sleeping pills. Goodbye to all of you who have tried so hard to comfort me in my loss of William Haynes, whom I have been with since 1926, he wrote. I now find it impossible to go on. I am much too lonely. When you look at Jimmy's suicide note, you you've understand that this was a, a love that had, had really transcended even death. I understood it. I understood how alone he felt. He had lost his lifetime mate. Their ashes were interred together in Santa Monica. Their story still stands as unique in the annals of Hollywood. He could have continued in a role of fame and fortune and public acclaim. And when he was asked to make a decision about that or his relationship with another human being, he chose the relationship. Many people can't do that. They don't have that kind of courage. Sadly, that includes most modern gay stars in an industry that remains largely closeted, more than 75 years after Billy Haynes and Jimmy Shields first came roaring out. What makes Billy Haynes' story important is the way he lived his life, not for any great movie role or even any great decor that he did, both of which are very memorable. But ultimately what makes Billy Haynes important is that he chose to live his life according to his own rules, according to his own values. 